Okay, so today I'm going to concentrate on the development of astronomy in uh, India during the medieval period. That's because when we talk about history of astronomy, usually we start with Harappa. That's the trend now. And uh, Harappan civilization is concentrated to the banks of uh, the uh, Sindhu River. So these are the settlements and this is where people start the uh, history of astronomy. And at the last slide, I'll go back to this and tell you how important it is for us uh, to change this now. Um, so when history of astronomy was written, say 100 years ago, uh, various British scholars have written uh, papers and books on this. And among the Indians, the one striking name is Bal Gangadhar Tilak. And they start from the Vedic period, that is 1500 uh, uh, BC. And then when you talk about the uh, Sulba Sutras, uh, it's not audible. Right? It's not Okay, is it better now? Yeah. So, uh, it's, it takes you back only to 1500 BC and these uh, texts called Shulba Sutras were not uh, dated very precisely. But now there are three volumes of them, so one goes beyond 1500 BC. How they actually do it, etc. is uh, different. But when these works were done, the existence of uh, Harappa or Mohenjo-Daro were not known. So now you have to change your uh, chronology of uh, Indian history of Indian astronomy. So that's where it stands today. And the monumental work by Marshall and uh, subsequently by Devi Prasad and Kosambi's father and son, you know, they introduced the uh, uh, Harappan uh, concept into the history of uh, not only India, but astronomy as well. So volumes and volumes have come out after that in the recent years, in, including the Harappan uh, uh, civilization. So basically, why why was astronomy needed in the ages, say, 3,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago? That was basically they were observing the sunrise and sunset positions and trying to understand the relation to the season. It's as simple as that. And then, of course, the moon rise and moon set timings, etc., phases were observed to form some kind of a calendar which was needed for um, their day to day activities. So it just limits us to that in the beginning. And of course, for navigation, because they were also traveling. Uh, so the need then we will extend to other uh, areas, namely the seasons. Why, why did they want to know the seasons? It could be because they were planning to hunt. And the pattern of hunting and then not hunting at some times of the year, etc. will have to be decided by looking at what's happening in the sky. And then the phases will be moved for day-to-day -day activities, for uh, fixing any uh, culture, cultural festival or anything like that. And to mark the time, say, of the birth of a king, or the coronation of a king, or any such uh, thing. But the most important is the onset of agriculture, because of which astronomy has its deep roots in folk uh, literature, which is uh, practically unknown today, not recorded anywhere. So go to any corner of India, the folk people will have some tradition related to astronomy. And uh, that is the one uh, subject which uh, needs more attention. So this is the basic plan they would have started perhaps 5,000 years ago. So you mark the winter solstice and the summer solstice uh, point, and then you put a second marker there and that becomes a clock. So that is the way the stone uh, alignments etc. are found here. And uh, then you realize that for the moon it doesn't work, so we have to offset it by 5 degrees on either side. And there is a pattern in the five degrees also. So all these they would have noted with uh, their observations. And uh, a lot of such things have been found in India. Uh, uh, Kameshwar Rao, Wahia, Sri Kumar Menon, all these people have worked on these kinds of stone alignments all over India. But I am particularly referring to this one in uh, South Africa near uh, home. It's, the river is called Komati River. 
because this has its roots from India. So it's a place uh, um, uh, on the river Komati, and it's between Mozambique, border of Mozambique and South Africa. And uh, it's called the Chariot of the Dying Sun. So this is how the stone patterns are. And then uh, uh, these are perfect uh, alignments for marking the winter solstice and summer solstice, which are reversed there. And so this is how it looks. And so you see the winter solstice, sunrise, 22nd June. So this is, it, it still exists and people go there for hiking and uh, the words that are written there and the, uh, uh, they are from India. So that is how they trace the origin of these to India. So I am showing this because you have many such things in India. I have given so many examples on which uh, Ameshwaram, Vahiya and Sri Kumar Menon have worked. But the other one I showed is in South Africa, so it should be interesting. So many of you who may go to Cape Town for uh, a next meeting, we plan a visit to this place and see this place. Then uh, eclipses and comets, you can understand. There must have been really uh, some uh, um, treat for the eye and therefore they would have recorded it. So this is a painting of uh, the total solar eclipse uh, from Kaunda. Um, can you see the eclipse? It's there in this corner. Yeah. yeah, this part is here. So you can see the almost total solar eclipse. This is a painting from uh, uh, the Washington Museum. But the once they put it onto the uh, net, I studied this and I came up with some date. And Kapoor, is he here? He also studied the same painting and we differed by about 50 years. Both of us arrived at the same similar uh, reason because the author, the name of the artist is known. It's based on that. So such records you will see plenty in Europe, but uh, in India it's difficult to find and Kapoor has found one more in uh, Amritsar. But then why did they need the stars and the planets? Okay, you need the sun for the year, you need the moon for the months. And eclipses are some beautiful sights in the sky, so you record it, comets are beautiful things, and why did you need the stars and the planets? So this is the question that comes to mind. But of course, we have all those things. So the seasons, variation with latitude and longitude, correction for refraction, parallax, all these things were very well established by the medieval period. So we have... Uh, people like uh, names like Aryabhata, Lalla, and uh, uh, Bhaskaracharya, who did uh, who wrote all those treatises, based on which the other next uh, generation followed the work, and so all these things were very well established by medieval uh, period before the advent of uh, Islamic rule and of course the colonial rule. Now, the star name, this is what I'm trying to say. So, in Mahabharata, Kritika, the name of the star appears as a star rising in the east during the time of Mahabharata. This word has been used for dating Mahabharata. So, the name of the stars, 27 stars, were very well known for time markers during the months. So, this is one place where we need to know the stars. So the 27 stars would suffice. And of course, you need to know about the pole star. And there are many more stars uh, which were of interest. And so all these stars were uh, listed and they were observing these stars. For example, they would look at the star which is on the meridian and decide the time of the night. And this is memorized in the form of a verse. So they recite that verse and know if this star is there, then the time of the night is this much. This was the way the stars were used for uh, measuring the time in the night. And uh, of course, uh, this is something, the effect of a uh, uh, shift of the uh, equinoxes that was also very well known. So this is another point which you can use for uh, dating historical events where no astronomer would have specifically written that I saw this happening, I saw this happening. No such record exists. Even in the books by Aryabhata or, or Rahamihira, there is no observation log book. 
So they were never writing any such thing. So that is one thing that we are missing. But we have to indirectly infer that they would have done this or putting this calculation. I'll show one or two examples which will prove that they were indeed observing and then marking the corrections which were needed from year to year. So the 27 stars, as I mentioned, <coughs> um, were uh, markers for birthdays. See, for example, Swati Chirunal has been named so because of the birth star. The moon was near the star Swati, Arcturus, and uh, so on. So this is a tradition which is being followed even today. So we have these 27 names very popular amongst us. And uh, the references to the stars come for uh, coronation and similar events. Not only in the Hindu or uh, uh, Jaina text, but even in Buddhist text. Text we may not have, but we have stone inscriptions where these uh, uh, words are written down. So we will know that the stars were being used extensively. Star names. So, okay, this I said. And folk tradition, as I mentioned already, is one of the richest uh, sources. And uh, at least in Karnataka, we have a method of uh, uh, identifying the time of the year uh, by these names only. So, which month is this? So, they call it Malay Nakshatra. That is, the rites are named after this, which indirectly means where the sun is. So, this is how the folk tradition has retained all these uh, things from maybe thousand years or even much before that. So, this is the uh, example I am trying to show for uh, understanding the meaning of what is Kritika at the time of Mahabharata. So, we know that because of the precision of equinoxes, uh, the pole is shifting and therefore, the pole star that we have now was not the pole star, say 2400 years ago, which was the uh, reason. And so, you have uh, uh, Kritika being marked there which corresponds to 2400 BC. So, that is how you are able to tie uh, the uh, events that are uh, mentioned in uh, Mahabharata. Okay, so you, uh, accordingly, the solstices and equinoxes are also uh, cited in many stone inscriptions and in many uh, uh, texts, other texts. But uh, uh, when we come to now, this is all from non astronomers. So, what were the astronomers doing? So, we get a clue of this from a text called Manasara, which is uh, dated 11th century. All of you know that the declination of the sun keeps changing throughout the year. So, if I measure the shadow of the uh, sun at any time of the day, I will be able to fix the declination only at noon. But in the morning to evening, the declination would have changed slightly. It may be half degree, it may be one degree by that amount. And how did they measure it? And how did they apply the correction for that? That is given in Manasara. And this word used for this is called apachaya. So they were not able to decode the meaning of the word apachaya. Chaya is the shadow. So there is something that is to be appended for the chaya. That's the meaning. And this was decoded by Vahashi. And this is the formula that is, or the words that is given in Manasara. And when you convert it into a graph, it comes like this with steps. You see, like this. And then he tried to understand what is the meaning of this because this is a solar longitude, which is the time of the year. So you have to apply some correction, which is of the order of one or two minutes, depending on the time of the year between uh, sunrise and sunset. So this small correction, which is uh, only uh, relevant uh, uh, for astronomical calculation, was incorporated into the text. And was not known for the last, uh, till the last 50 years or so, till Uhashi published this. Because the word Abachaya means this. This has not been written down anywhere. So that is how we get to know about this. So what I am trying to say is that measurements of this nature, going to the accuracies of half a degree in the position of the sun, was being done, but have not been recorded in any log books and we have to indirectly uh, get to know about this. And we have all these uh, books uh, 
which were available in Sura Siddhanta Veda, Madhya Tisha, Aryabhatiya, Pancha Siddhantika, Khanda Khatika. These are all prior to 10th century, except uh, Siddhanta Shiromani and Siddhanta Shekara, they were 11th century. So all these books were available, but then what was it needed? What was needed for the later astronomers? The theory is already established. Now you have to apply correction so that all those calculations are valid. So the commentaries were written and the corrections were incorporated in the co commentaries. So during the medieval period, a lot of effort went into the preparations of preparation of these kinds of corrections that are needed for the formula provided in these uh, classical texts, you can say. So that is where medieval period contribution begins. Um, okay, I will briefly mention the procedure that is uh, uh, adopted. You just count how many days have elapsed, elapsed from a particular um, point, which is called the onset of Kali Yuga or something like that, which they tie up with Mahabharata and so on. Let us leave that aside. It's a particular day on which uh, the sun and the moon and perhaps an eclipse also took place. That means uh, uh, from that date to today, you count the number of days. That is called as Ahargana. So how do you do that? So because you are using the lunar calendar and today's uh, date will be mentioned in lunar calendar. Imagine there is no calendar available. So today you look at the moon and this is the fifth day of the moon or seventh day of the moon phase, etc. That's what you know. And how many full moons have elapsed from the beginning of this year, you know. So based on all these things, you will count Ahargana, which is a nine-digit number. It go, goes to nine-digit number. Now, the Siddhartic text says, say that if this many number of days have elapsed, the planet which may be the sun, which may be the moon or any other planet, would have covered so many revolutions. So that's the starting point. Yes. Which planets did they know? Uh, I am talking about uh, the five naked eye planets only. So five means moon, sun and... Moon and sun also. No, I mentioned here, it, uh, the word graha means something which is moving in the sky. So the sun and the moon also were called Graha because they were moving in the sky. So all together, all together, seven. Seven. Okay. Five naked eye planets. They were called Tara Graha because Tara means a star. They look like dots in the sky. So they were called Tara Graha. So five star planets and two sun and moon. Okay. I'll come to the other one just now. Okay. So, uh, so how do you increase the accuracy? of your measurement. So you, you have measured something as per the formula, the moon should have been here, but it is here. So you have to add that correction. Instead of adding few minutes, they will correct the number of revolutions itself. That is how they were applying the correction. And the interesting thing is that we know that all these are elliptical orbits. The apogee of that, no, this is a geocentric thing. So they called it apogee and mandocha they call it. That itself is changing the position. So how it is changing the position? So that was also a variable parameter that was used. And uh, so for the sun and the moon, the correction is only for the elliptical orbit. For the other five, their position relative to the sun, that also is another correction that is added. So that they have different names. One is called mantra, the other is called shidra. So if you translate it literally, mantra means a slow, Shigra means something is fast. No, that's not the meaning. The meaning is uh, something different. And the interesting thing is that you have two epicycles corresponding to each of them, but you cannot apply them together. You have to apply one, go to that position, and from that position, you have to calculate the correction for the next one. So this was the procedure that was being followed. And uh, this is one example where uh, the corrections I'm showing. See here. This is uh, 6th century, this is uh, Siddhanta Shiromani, etc. This is about 11th century. Look at these uh, numbers. The number of revolutions of the moon, it is uh, running to uh, 336, but here it is 300. So these kinds of uh, corrections, they incorporated so that finally when you divide one by the other, the accuracy that you wanted is achieved. So this is how they were doing it. Okay, And then the mathematical... Uh, uh, 
uh, formula also, uh, a year is having 365 and a fraction. You all know that. And uh, then when you want to calculate the number of days, you have to take care of the number of uh, intercalary months. That, that's in the lunar system. We all know that. We have an extra month uh, sometimes, once in three years, uh, to, account, to match the movement of the sun and the moon. So that you have to incorporate and finally you have to get the total number of solar months. I will go to the next one because uh, I try to rewrite the formula in a better way. Okay, here it is. So they knew that the duration of the year was 365 days, 15 is so one day is consisting of 60. And then this is 160th of that called Viga This is 160th of that called Pare. This is 160th of that called Tatpare. So this, they knew it to this accuracy. Now I am able to write it like this, but they did not write it like this, but they prefer to write it in these kinds of fractions. So if you want to calculate the intercalary ones, this is the fraction. So every time you want to do this, you will have to be working with uh, such big numbers. Instead of that, they modified it like this. So in days, the, the, the uh, book will say, Take the number of uh, number of days and then uh, add five divide by one nine seventy six and then this itself you divide by one four nine four five and uh, take it out. This will be the worst. What is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is this will take you to this number to a certain accuracy and you will need to have a correction only after fourteen nine four five days. That's the meaning. So you have to keep track of this and then. Once it crosses 14, 9, 4, 5 days, then you will apply the correction. Then in terms of the months also, it is the same thing. So this is written in one book. This is written in one book. And then this number 916 changes to 903 in later text. So this is how the corrections were being incorporated from time to time, which we will get to know only from the text of the medieval period. So this is how it was done. And... Uh, then in uh, about the 14th century, the sign tables were ready. You know, 11th century itself, the sign tables were ready because you have to calculate the correction as a sign function. So the sign starting from 1 degree, 290 degree, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the things were available. They were memorized. They were available in the form of a table. And you could have interpolated them between 10 degrees. So this was also possible. But in about 13th century, they learned how to express this as a series. We all learned that in our mathematics, how to express the sign formula as a series. This was known to reduce the uh, time needed for the calculation but to a great extent. And then we also see that the elements of calculus uh, were already introduced by the time of uh, Bhattacharya. So, sorry, Bhaskaracharya. The... Uh, uh, for example, if you want to calculate the instantaneous velocity and if it is moving uh, in as a sign function because the projection you are taking, the uh, uh, differential of a sign function is cos. So he says directly you take the cos of this angle. So till then the velocity etc. was being mentioned as sign but suddenly it changes over to cos which means something you know already. So this is the kind of uh, um, uh, hidden meanings that are uh, covered in these Karana texts. So they knew Tathkalika means you have to take the differential. So a sign function becomes a cos function. So this is what. And then uh, these people who, the challenge was uh, to calculate or predict the time of the eclipses very precisely, especially total eclipses. So this part uh, was done by a few astronomers. And uh, the previous calculation will fetch them some uh, timings which were verified. And at the end of that, they were honored. How do we know that? There are stone inscriptions wherein they would have written that so and so was honored. Such a big uh, uh, astronomer was honored. Um, usually, this will be following one or two total eclipses. So we know that it must be because he calculated that very precisely or so. And from these stone inscriptions, we also get to know the names of some astronomers whose uh, work uh, we are yet to find out. So that way, we were lucky to get one or two names uh, for uh, those things are available as uh, palm leaf manuscripts now. Okay. Uh, so, in the medieval period, 
it was all commentaries and uh, we have so many commentaries 17 11th century onwards so you can see right up to here and uh, uh, yeah. here see he says number of solar months he simply says add 10 where is this 10 coming from that is his own correction the author has said that i have added 10 so that i get this uh, correctly so that's the correction from then onwards people will have to follow and uh, i told you about a number 903 it becomes 900 so it has to be subtracted and so on these kinds of corrections we find only in this text uh, as commentaries which were written in the medieval period okay okay so was there no interaction between these various uh, astronomers yeah there was interaction between oh, yeah. because you can see the cross in the in the opening of every book they will say uh, we are indebted to these astronomers who have taught us this and there you will find all these things so some names uh, for example there is a place called Heed in Maharashtra there was a school of astronomers there we don't know anything about it today but uh, some of these texts will say that uh, uh, a great astronomer from this place has taught me this I am grateful to him he thinks like no, interaction among contemporaries yes it was there uh, for example, Siddhanta so the corrections can be uniform across the places, right? Uh, I think they were exchanging. Okay. So when he says that I am adding 10, he doesn't tell, tell that uh, I am doing it myself. Oh. Uh, you see a contemporary text there also in the so huh, Yes. So there was a good interaction. Nice. So did, did they mention why they thought these corrections were needed from time to time? No, why part is not there. They, 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 no, no. they knew that it's not such a uniform motion that they are seeing in the sky, so they needed the corrections. That's it. Now, instead of telling you all those corrections individually, I am thinking of presenting to you a different way. Namely, I will compare the different methods over, uh, uh, say, 400 years. So, I have taken a book by name Grahanamala and I am going to do this for one particular solar eclipse. Grahanamala, interestingly, is a book written by a king uh, who, who was a small time king called, uh, in some part of uh, North India. I don't know the name. He was uh, conquered by the Mughal Emperor Akbar when he was arrested. He sat in the prison and he prepared this table of a canon of eclipses from 1600 to 2600. So he prepared this table and Akbar was impressed and so he released him subsequently and then uh, uh, the, the book is available in print form now. And then I have taken the other one. This is a book in the Oriental Research Institute in Mysore. It uh, is a canon of eclipses from 1800 to 1900. And uh, then this is the book uh, written in 1604. It has changed the pattern of calculation by introducing the seven day week concept. It's used for uh, parity check. And then you have another um, 100 year old uh, book which is available in printed form. It is a method adopted from V.B. Uh, Kaker who was a very well-known astronomer. He uses the 19-year-old, 19-year cycle for fixing the uh, epoch very precisely, positions very precisely. I have taken this uh, eclipse, August 18, 1868, all uh, of you know the importance of this. And the path passed through uh, South India. Uh, so many people have done the calculations uh, uh, for this. Uh, the team of Italians and uh, British, they all have made the observations of this. So, how would this be according to the four texts? How if you know, how the timings match? This is what I have tried to uh, uh, show you here. And uh, you know about this uh, helium discovery, etc. That's uh, what we know today. So, this is the eclipse I have chosen. So, the first book is this Grahanamala, which is available in printed form. Uh, as I said, this is written in the 1600 around that time, and um, I uh, all of them generally do the calculation for Ujjain. Ujjain was the time, so 
The total duration is 2 hours, 20 minutes and 48 seconds according to that. But from any ephemeris that is available online, you know, not only NASA, x or any such stellarium, you'll get it as 2 hours, 31 minutes and 21 seconds. <laughs> And then the next one is Grana Darpana, which is in Mysore. What method they have used is not known. And this eclipse is covered because it is in 1868. And this is the way it is written. The, the text is written like this. And then they give the figure here and indicate in the, where it is uh, the first, uh, second contact is and where the third contact is. That direction will be mentioned. So the, uh, the, this is how the book is. And this gives <coughs> two uh, hours 51 56 seconds and compares with two hours 51 32 seconds. And then the third one is this book uh, dated 1604. He has given only the method I did the calculation as suggested in that because it's a method which is different from the other uh, earlier ones. So here you see a difference of one minute, two hours 52 minutes and 40 seconds and 51 20 seconds. How did they time it? Huh? How did they time it to the seconds? This is calculation. This is calculation. Calculation huh. No, I told you they don't keep a log book. They did not say that this matched or anything. No, how do you know indirectly that it matched? Somebody would have given them an award. Okay, there also there is a problem. Even in Chinese records where the log book was maintained, you won't know whether it's a total eclipse or a 99% eclipse. Because from the naked eye observations, you cannot make up. Right? So this kind of a, a groundability <laughs> is there. But what I'm showing you know is only the calculation part. There is no record of any observation. Uh, then the last one is uh, the uh, 1910 uh, uh, text which is based on V. B. Kekar had understood all these problems and he incorporated the corrections as applicable as was applicable for the year uh, 1860 or something like that. So uh, he must have observed this eclipse, but I don't see that uh, mentioned anywhere in uh, his book. But he has mentioned about uh, having observed the 1874 transit of Venus, but this particular eclipse he has not mentioned. So here also the difference is only 20 seconds. This means from time to time, the corrections were being incorporated. So this is the uh, approach we have for the medieval period. And uh, the interesting point is the, um, yes. Eclipses were also which uh, location? Uh, Ujjain. All of them. Hmm. But Ujjain did not have total. So, I had to apply the correction for, see, one place was Shringeri, the other was Mysore, and the third one just says 18 degree uh, latitude, and the name of the place I do not know. Maybe it was somewhere in uh, uh, Maharashtra. Uh, somewhere, there is a, a name of the place starting with a M. I don't know whether that town exists today or not. Male or Mal, Male, some such name is there. And the interesting point is this, uh, she asked me about the seven planets. These are the two other planets. Okay? These are all the, also points which are moving in the sky. What are they? These are the nodes of the moon's orbit. Ascending node and the descending node. I, I consider this as an ingenious concept because they knew that the two points were moving in the sky. So they gave it the status of the planet. And so they were able to calculate the position of the node very precisely. How did they do it? You know, that, that's the part. So they were watching the movement of the moon uh, meticulously every night. And when it crosses the ecliptic, that point they had to write down. So they must have been doing the uh, thing very precisely. So Rahu and Ra effectively eight planets, Ketu is one di diametrically opposite to it. So that is how these uh, Rahu and Ketu names uh, figure in, but no astronomer uses this, no astronomy text uses these names, Rahu and Ketu. They call it uh, Pata Bindu or Parva Bindu or something like that. But only the other texts, non-astronomical texts, they, are, they like this word, they like the story associated with this, so they use these names. Okay. Um, I uh, uh, was studying the... Uh, 12th century, uh, 13th century table 
it's just a table of numbers for the five planets. And uh, so I was able to uh, uh, get, get this graph done, which uh, shows how it matches. This is the uh, longitude of Jupiter and Saturn. All of you saw this conjunction beautifully happening. So this is uh, the way it matches. Now, this is the precision correction that is needed. And also the beginning of the year, so you, it gets offset uh, both in this direction and this uh, direction because all the calculations that uh, I talked about year two did not take into account that the precision correction. But they definitely knew about the precision correction because without that, you cannot get the declination. So the declination is defined by the uh, point where the ecliptic and the equator cross. And therefore, they knew about the precision correction. Whenever they wanted to know the declination, they would apply the ayanamsha. That was the word that was used. So for these steps, it used to be something like 16 degrees or 18 degrees. Today, it is 24 degrees. So they applied this correction, got the declination value. This was known. And graha is a word which is something that is moving in the sky. So they called this ayanamsha also as a graha. They assigned a period of 25,000 years for this. And then just as you would calculate the position or the correction for something which is uh, known to have a specific orbital period, they would calculate the precision correction for this, which works out very well. So the word graha here is not to be mistaken to mean uh, a planet like a body like Venus. And uh, this 13th century table, I have compared here. So I have compared it with the exudium. This is a free uh, site where from where you can get the ephemerates for any year. So now you see how it exactly matches here. So that means if you apply the precision correction, this will go up here and matches with that. And you also have to move it this way because the uh, beginning of the year is slightly offset. Yeah, because it's lunar calendar that is used. Uh, then these texts that I am referring to as uh, tables were called Karanas and Sarini. Sarini is a table of numbers, whereas Karana is uh, uh, every, the same thing stated in the form of a poem. So you recite a poem and for every year you, call, you, you compose a new poem. So that's the kind of uh, uh, method they use for memorizing the things. And that's where these poems were circulated and everybody would know what is the poem for this year. Last year's would be forgotten. So this year you will have a new poem and you memorize that and calculate all the positions for that. So the uh, uh, type of uh, uh, corrections I have already mentioned. So they were excellent uh, uh, mathematicians. So they were able to apply these corrections. And that's when I feel that the regional languages will have uh, more uh, input in, in this direction. So, uh, Kannada, Telugu, and Malayalam, and even Tamil. Tamil is, is a problem because uh, uh, nobody is able to read that and understand. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, um, in the other languages, uh, people have come up with uh, these things. So, I um, again, I took this uh, Sarini from the 13th century uh, origin and then I have matched uh, the, uh, with the uh, exudia and see how finely it fits. This should have continued like this, okay? But uh, I deliberately wanted to show it changing from 360 to zero. Even that happens on the same day. So to that extent, it matches very well. This is for Mars. This is for planet, position of planet Mars for a specific year. And the table simply gives the numbers. So you will have to understand how to uh, decode that and convert that into a, a graph. So this uh, kind of, uh, uh, I mean, this will be known to only some selected people. Not every common man will be able to appreciate the uh, uh, use of a table of this nature. So you know about uh, these things. I don't have to spend time on this because these are very well known. This is because I'm covering the medieval period, the various efforts to improve the accuracies of, of observations uh, was attempted by Jaising. And um, 
generally, uh, even when Dr. Ratnashree was uh, trying to uh, use this for current observations, she was only concentrating on daytime observations, shadows, and the shadows will become very diffuse and so on. But these are more relevant for night sky observations because you have a sighting tube and your positioning can be as accurate as the point, the arc second there. So that part has not been verified so far for these instruments. And uh, then comes the Islamic rule. Uh, the effect we will start seeing the, by about uh, 13th century. Before that, it was one way. The Arabs came here and uh, took the books from here. But the effect of that, the return thing, uh, we come to know only by the uh, introduction of this instrument called the astrolabe. This is basically an Arab instrument. And these are the various parts of the instrument. Uh, the most important is this. This is the plate which defines your uh, uh, latitude, which is which is the job of the astronomer to create this. And then this is the red ray, which is uh, it's a star dial. Every point here corresponds to a star, and the name of the star is written here. So you can move it. It's a movable thing. So you measure the altitude. For measuring the altitude on the reverse side of this, there is a sighting device, this one, with two holes. So we measure the altitude and then come back to this dial from the altitude measurement, get the other uh, right ascension, declination, whatever you want from this dial. So this was a very handy dial. And very quickly, this instrument was uh, adapted by uh, the local scholars. And then there were families in Lahore and Gujarat known for producing excellent quality of uh, astrolabes. The other thing that happened uh, during the Islamic rule is the translations of these uh, treatises uh, from Sanskrit to Persian. And then they were carried to uh, in Europe via these uh, uh, countries. So this is the uh, very brief summary of uh, Islamic rule. But then you see this in, uh, in Jaipur, the instrument was widely used here and uh, you can see the size of the astrolabe, so what accuracy they would have achieved uh, by using this kind of a device for the position of uh, planets and even stars. And I show this particular one, which was uh, uh, from Ahmedabad. This is with uh, uh, some person in Brussels, uh, a private uh, property. And you see the numerals are in Devanagari. So the, the Islamic instrument was adapted to uh, local usage. And this is the close-up view of this. And this particular thing is very important because this was designed in 1605. And these are the names of Shravana, Vega, Swati and all these stars and uh, the supernova there is an extra tip here corresponding to the 1604 supernova that's how this particular astrolabe becomes very very useful so here i have given the uh, um, all those points here and this is the location of the supernova here that is here so when this instrument was uh, studied uh, say last 50 years ago or something uh, they were trying to identify all the stars and here they were not able to identify anything corresponding to this. And there's a faint star here, New Sagittarius. So the catalog says it is New Sagittarius. But then I look back because New Sagittarius is something that doesn't match with the magnitude. Then this number gave me the clue 1605. So this must be the supernova and it matched uh, perfectly. Uh, then these uh, French astronomers who came, this, uh, I'm, I'm covering the uh, chronological thing, so we can't forget this person, Lege until I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly or not. <laughs> I mean, that's how it is. And he spent, uh, he is called an unlucky astronomer uh, because he came to observe the transit of Venus and missed both of them for some reason or the other. <laughs> And he spent these eight years very usefully here. So I consider him a lucky astronomer because he was able to, uh, he observed from Pondicherry. He was in Pondicherry. 
he, he produced two volumes. These are the two volumes. This has all the information, not only of astronomy, but uh, the flora, fauna, the lifestyle, social, cultural aspects, traditions, everything is in view. Whatever he saw, he has recorded it there. And uh, uh, he learned how the traditional scholars here calculate the eclipses. So he learned that method and wrote that uh, for the benefit of the people there. So that's a very useful thing. So I think this was a very he was a very lucky astronomer because he was able to do all these things. He was unlucky because he lost his property there. They, they declared him dead. And all his property was distributed uh, to various people. But uh, maybe he got it uh, somehow later on. I think it was all distributed. <laughs> he was penniless when he landed there. After yeah, his name is Lejonti, means uh, the kind. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he carried many flowers from here. So he named uh, some of them after uh, some great mathematicians. And so on. And his life uh, is very interesting because he had so many shipwrecks and he had to suffer from many terrible diseases. But he managed to reach, he finally reached uh, France by foot. Okay, so you can imagine <laughs> how, how he must have struggled. <laughs> Okay, then uh, 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 as far as the um, traditional things is concerned, this one name, you have this book here in the library, uh, Kala Sankalita. John Warren, he uh, worked in the Madras Observatory. He was another person who studied the method of uh, calculation of eclipses by Indian scholars. And he translated, he wrote them for the first time in English. And uh, it was discussed in Royal Society also, I heard. So this is one important thing because that's when slowly this got uh, written in uh, English and uh, French. So people there in Europe also came to know about the depth of knowledge that was already existing in India. So the impact of collegial religion on traditional scholars, mm -hmm. the family suffered, I should say, because this was after 19th century. Mm -hmm. Uh, the system of education changed. So, uh, there, there was only a small group of astronomers who were left uh, isolated from the mainstream. And uh, they were the only ones who uh, retained uh, all these uh, knowledge for themselves because the others didn't bother about it. Unfortunately, that's the one we are able to lay our hands on today. So they have pre uh, preserved the palm leaf manuscripts uh, in their houses uh, very religiously. They kept it uh, very safe. And so we are able to read them today. And uh, some came forward to translate them into English and French, uh, joined hands with the British uh, people. And so the two names that I mentioned, Babu Deva Shastri and Sudhakar Jivedi, they did a uh, lot of work in this aspect. And that's how all of us are able to read it today. Otherwise, we would not have known it at all. And uh, this is a typical classroom a photo which is available on the net by Bapu Deva Shastri. So this is the globe. He is using the globe to teach a, a group of students about uh, astronomy. So this is a classroom in Varanasi. And uh, then you know about the establishment of observatories. So this institute itself has a long history. So I don't have to tell all that history again. So Madras Observatory. And of course, Tiruvananthapuram also had an observatory by Swati Tirunan. Lucknow, Dehradun, and many more were there, but eventually they were lost. Fortunately, Madras and Trivandrum are still surviving. So they were exposed to the new techniques of measurement. See, even when the telescope was brought and given to Jai Singh, it was only a tool to see the things. But then the actual process of measuring the position of the star with a micrometer kind of a device was not established. So he was not able to do any such measurement as such with the telescope, although he used and uh, monitored and measured the position of the satellites of Jupiter. But these things developed even in Europe subsequently and gradually they were transferred here. So people here came to know about it. And there were many attempts to blend the traditional methods uh, with these uh, European techniques. 
their Chintamani Raghunath Acharya from Madras Observatory has a great role to play, but he did not succeed. Same with uh, Kekar, he predicted the position of Pluto in 1911 itself. He was uh, well versed with the Besselian method of uh, calculation. So this is the year. So he had predicted the position of Pluto here based on the alignment of Neptune and uh, Uranus. He calculated it just as you do it for Galilean satellites. He extended the same method for this and he had done this in 11 itself. But you know that uh, Tambo discovered it almost 19 years later. So it was known but it was not publicized at all. Similarly, the comet discovery by Subramanya Iyer from the Trivandrum Observatory is not known to people at all. He lost his uh, chance because his uh, uh, report reached late. By then, somebody else had already submitted to the Royal Society and so the comet got that Russian fellow's name. We have to remember this uh, Pathani Chandrasekhar Samantha because uh, he did not believe the uh, European methods at all. And he continued in the traditional way and these were the instruments he designed for himself for making uh, observations. And uh, even in his book he says that the uh, other people say that uh, earth is not at the center but I don't believe them, I believe that the earth is in the center. But all the rest of the, you know, how does it matter for calculation because you are moving, making only relative positions uh, are needed. So, his calculations were perfect. He observed the transit of Venus and so on. So, he was the last scholar, I should say, who um, depended only on these uh, traditional methods. And uh, then uh, the uh, efforts to revive the tradition, um, Raghunath Achari and Bal Gangadhar Tilak also tried to do this. And there was one um, Ka Kalinath Mukherjee in uh, uh, Calcutta who also tried to introduce uh, the Western astronomy to common man. Uh, they were not very popular but for copying the names. And of course the monumental work is by Shankar Balak Krishna Dikshit. There are two volumes of them. Single-handedly he prepared these two volumes. He, he travelled all over India, spoke to the traditional scholars and found out what were the books available, what were the manuscripts available. He made a list of all those things and that's a source book even today, although he wrote it uh, uh, 120 years ago. And uh, on a small scale, some instruments and some teaching is going on in several uh, small places and not uh, highlighted anywhere. That way this uh, uh, online catalog, descriptive catalog in Indian astronomical instruments by S.R. Sharma is very useful. It's a 3000 page uh, uh, volume available freely on the, anybody can download it. In fact, I downloaded the image of the astrolabe from this only. And he has included even this uh, 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 thing in my, this is still existing. It, it had uh, been in very bad shape uh, till about a year ago or so when I went and asked for it. I said, I'll take it to the planetarium and display, please give it us. This was prepared in 1930 or so by a scholar. What is his name? Sheshachar. Karur Sheshachar. That's the name of the Mahavidwar. So he prepared this as per as has been described in Bhaskara Charya Siddhanta Shuromani. This was being used, but after his time, uh, this was junked. So that's when I went and asked that we want that instrument, we will display that in the planetary. And then they got it painted and you know, it's, this is how it is in Mysore now. Um, they use it for teaching what is called as Jyotisha, which is mostly astrology, unfortunately. And this particular book by S.R. Sharma has this instrument listed. And... Um, all the astrolabes which are scattered all over the world, made in India. And that's how I came to know that uh, Lahore and Ahmedabad had a very strong group of uh, instrument makers. So that's all listed there. It's a very useful uh, uh, source for... Uh, um, um, this was online only um, two, three years ago. 
And so a lot of more, more work in this field awaits uh, scholars. Mm, only 450 out of about 9,000 texts have been edited so far. So post-independence, I have to remember these uh, three pioneers. K.V. Sharma, there is an institute uh, after him in Chennai. K. Shukla. Shukla was here, I think. He gave a talk here. I don't remember. must be in 78 or 79. Uh, those days, I did not understand any of the things that he, I confess. I did not understand anything. Of, I sat here and listened to him, but I did not understand anything. Ohashi, he passed away only two years ago. He uh, came from Japan and uh, worked with Shukla. And he was the one who brought out all the details of the instruments that are described in the various uh, texts. And of course, R.C. Gupta, a uh, very great mathematician, and Balachandra Rao here in Bangalore and his uh, group, they have come out uh, because all these medieval texts are receiving only attention now. And uh, I, it's uh, my duty to remember all these people who have uh, brought this to light. So I started with Harappa, but uh, someday we may have to revise the history of astronomy again because I have found that you have traces of them in this part also. Here also you have a lot of uh, information on the Indian calendar system, the so-called Hindu calendar. I don't like to use the word Hindu calendar, but that's how the books are written. So this is the silk route. The silk route may as well be the astronomy route also. So here you have uh, in this part of uh, Asia, and even in this part of Asia, you have a lot of influence of the uh, Indian um, uh, eclipse calculations and so on. That 1868 eclipse, which I mentioned, was observed from Thailand and the king there uh, was able to predict the time of the eclipse using Surya Siddhartha. That's what he has declared. So it was very well known. Therefore, we may have to change the history of astronomy, uh, not only from Harappan time, but uh, maybe with this we, we may get some more information. We may have to push it back also. So that's where I and stop. So I think I have conveyed something, some information about the medieval, uh, what happened in the medieval period in Indian astronomy. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sailor Ishmael, for taking us through progression of astronomy in India during medieval period. Can you take some comments? Yes, yeah, sure. Are there any comments? Um, Thank you, ma'am, for such an important report. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First one is, is there any written thing like the distance of, uh, from uh, sun and earth or moon and earth in the medieval history? Yes. So, how this calculate? Yojana. They use the unit called Yojana. Uh, one Yojana is approximately five miles or eight miles, depending on uh, uh, which text you are using. So they always talk in terms of the ratios, but the uh, even the circumference of the earth, uh, the distance to the moon, distance to the sun, everything is given in Yojanas, but there is a very serious error in the case of the sun. Okay, but the moon is okay. So is there any way to define how these calculations are done? Is there any? How these calculations are done? Huh. Is it written? No, it is not written. That way, how did they calculate 5000 Yojanas? He is not written. But you can infer it. He, he describes that there is an observer standing on the equator. There is another observer standing at the pole. It, if not pole, 90 degrees away, then what is that angle? He defines parallax. So you know that that's the method that must have been used for calculation. So directly he does not say I stood here and observed and so I got this number. No, that is not written in the yes. Next question is, as you said that they uh, calibrate the planetary motions. Hmm. Um, so is there any idea about retrograde and progress? Yes, of course. That's the second correction I talked about. The, see, I told you about two corrections. The first correction is for all planets. That's for the, uh, that's for the elliptical orbit. <coughs> The second correction is relevant only for these five planets, which is relative to the position of the sun. So at what position of the sun, it starts going backward. This angle will be specified. 
and uh, so they say bhauma the bhauma means uh, mars the sun of earth that's the meaning so that's the mythological name so bhauma means they always give it in the same sequence first mars then mercury then jupiter then uh, venus then saturn in the same sequence they simply list out the numbers those numbers are at what angle the retrograde starts at what angle it stops so this is very clearly defined in all the texts they knew about it very well thank you Uh, yeah, you have mentioned one uh, in one of the uh, slides that uh, one day is divided into sixty thirty-five uh, percent. Mm. So why sixty has been taken? No, I don't know the why part. I see that they have done it. Okay. okay. So you you can speculate any anything for that. But sixty is for convenience because the next unit is again divided by sixty. The one is also divided by sixty. When you go to the angle. Again, divide by sixty. Divide by sixty. See, they were working with fractions. So, multiplying a fraction with another fraction, uh, if if they are all on the same side, whether you are you are using the angle units or whether you are using the time units, the the multiplication becomes very easy. So, sixty is the. Thanks. Uh, what about catalogs? Did they make any stellar catalogs or something like that? Stellar catalogs are all with the. Uh, uh, yes, I I have uh, studied two catalogs. One is uh, dated fifteenth uh, century. It lists hundred stars. Again, it's not a table. It's uh, verses. So all the numbers, the longitude and the latitude. Are written in terms of words. They are that's called bhuta sankhya. Bhuta sankhya means you express a, a number as a a quantity. If you want to say two, you say ice. That's the word that is used. If you want to say four, you say Vedas. Same as katapayadi. Huh? No, no, it's not katapayadi. This is called bhuta sankhya. Katapayadi also is used. Huh? So Rama Loka is a katapayadi thing. Rama Loka means ka means one, la means three. And ma means one, zero, and so on. So that is how you have to read backwards and get the number. Whereas Bhuta Sankhya is uh, objects. Bhuta is an object. So all these numbers are written down. So to decode those twenty-eight verses and prepare a table, it took me three years. The table is done. Okay. So one hundred and six stars. One hundred and six stars. Coordinates? Are yes, coordinates? it coordinates. It coordinates and magnitude. And magnitude. magnitude. Pramana, they call it as pramana. Mm -hmm. So, vimana, ekamana, a first magnitude. Sirius is first magnitude, and so on. It's it's there. Mm -hmm. And the coordinates for what? Coordinates for that particular thing, and then they give what is called as paramona tamsha. That means uh, the maximum uh, mm -hmm. altitude. Maximum altitude is given. So, from that also you can calculate the declination, provided you know the latitude of the place. I used it to get the latitude of the place. It's somewhere near Delhi. It's not Delhi. Slightly to the north of Delhi that he has prepared the cat. Mm -hmm. So I was able to. Mm -hmm. His name is Nityananda. Nityananda, unfortunately, is not today. They were struggling. His name is Nityananda. This is about fourteenth century. Okay. Are there anyone uh, online? No I just have a quick question. Oh, yeah. So during our observatory open days, sometimes you know people they come and they ask uh, how close or how far is astrology with astronomy. So how do you explain that to general public? I, 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 I well, first of all, I say I know nothing about astrology. What I'm going to tell you is only astronomy. Okay. okay. So when they say astrology. They mean predictive astrology, right? Yes. So that is something which is not written by any of these fellows. Okay. So none of the astronomy texts that I have mentioned so far talk anything about astrology or prediction or anything. So when they write a horoscope, it's a um, measure of time. If you, if you want to uh, mention the time, a particular calendar is followed in this part of India. You go some hundred miles away, then there is another calendar according to that king. 
But then the sky will not change. Therefore, they mark the positions of the planets, the sun and the moon, and then the 60 year cycle. So if you make a mistake, you will be off by 60 years. So if they say Prabhava is the name of the year, Prabhava can be this or the one which is 60 years or 60 years that way. So that way this year's horoscope was only a measure of time. So that for writing that, you need the information about the planets. Okay. I just missed uh, the, the concept you said for Rahu and Ritu. What could be the thing? You had an explanation for that. Which is repeated, I, I missed. No, Rahu and Ketu are the two uh, nodes. Rahu and Ketu are the nodes of what? The intersection of the moon's orbit and the sun's orbit. Okay. So, ascending node and the descending node. Yeah. You know, these two yeah. points, these are the points which are reference to them. They have a period of 18.6 years. That is known. That's right. And this is in retrograde. If the planets are moving in this direction, Rahu and Ketu are moving in this direction. So, for all corrections, they say this all corrections are additive except for Rahu, they will say. Because for Rahu, the correction will be in the opposite direction. So, they considered Rahu as a planet, fixed its position by calculations using the same method they use for the five planets. The only difference is that it has a period of 18.6 years and it is moving in the opposite direction. So, this they knew. Interesting that they could use as an abstract concept. Huh. Yeah. No, how will, how, will you, how will you make a common man understand it? So you call, you create a story and call it a demon. There is a demon sitting in the sky and that's the position in so on. Now, astronomers know what it is. But a common man will not understand. So you have to create a demon so that they will remember. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the Long live India and France friendship.